All right, so good morning, and um, this morning our topic for Fridays with Fiscal is going to be um, major updates from the recent releases. I'm going to start out with the USAS side here, and we are looking at um, basically the updates 7.31 through 7.37. And um, I know you usually start on the wiki, but I'm just going to go ahead. I'm already in the software here. And I'm going to kind of go through um, our different categories that we've seen updates in. And our first place is within the reports. So I'm heading into the report manager. The first one I'm going to mention, um, we're not going to look too deep at this, but I'm just going to pull up a revenue summary. Uh, the, dynam the dynamic sort options, uh, that did come out in January, so technically that falls within this category. Um, that's this um, breakup of having your report, your query options, and your sort options. So that applies to all of the template reports. Um, we did a full uh, Fridays with Fiscal on that in January. So if you are interested in more information on that, the recording is out there on the training page. The next thing I want to mention, um, which is why I pulled up this revenue summary report, is uh, this last line right here on the filters is exclude accounts with zero amounts. Um, we had this available as a filter that you could add to your reports before. It's that all amount zero filter. Um, there were a couple updates related to this. And the first one is that it now takes into account year to date amounts. So um, if the account has no activity or basically no totals for the fiscal year-to-date figures, the month year-to-date figures, and now the calendar year-to-date figures, um, it will be filtered out of the report if you use this option. The next part of this is that the filter is automatically on some of these reports now. So um, your account reports, so uh, revenue summary, your um, expenditure sum or your budget summary rather, um, appropriation summary, it's now going to show on here like we're seeing on, on this last line of this report. And how you use this is if you filter this to be true, then it will generate a report that will exclude all the accounts where all amounts that qualify are equal to zero. So all of those year-to-date amounts are zero. Um, if you put true, those will not be included on your report. That's awesome. If you put false, then it's the opposite. You'd get a report of only the accounts that have all zeros in every qualifying column. And if you leave it blank, then you're going to get the mixture of both. You'll just get all of the accounts that qualify based on any other parameters that you enter in the report. Amanda, this is Dee. Before yeah. you go off of that, and this was something sure. that we found, and I apologize, I am not remembering the exact terminology, but if you have the module turned on for the requisitions. Oh, uh, yes, the yes. pre-encumbrances, yes. yes. So if that is turned on and you have the pre-encumbrances, you may find some accounts showing up on your reports that appear to be all zeros, but the reason it's showing up on your report is because you have that pre-encumbrance module turned on and you have an encumbrance out there while it doesn't actually show as a number on your report, it does mean that there is something out there. That's a great note. Thank you, Dee. All right, so the next thing, um, I don't know that I'm going to show this next one, uh, just a couple other kind of uh, miscellaneous updates that happened with um, reports related here is um, the 1099 vendor report. There were some headers updated. Um, actually, thanks to D and our UAT group, they had looked at that report and some of those headers kind of, um, they, they didn't, they weren't like straightforward. So we updated them for clarity so that um, that looked a little bit better when that report is run and that's a little bit um, more clear. Uh, we also did fix a bug that was including budget amounts with a future date in the totals for the appropriation summary. So um, 
for the most part, you know, you, your districts may not notice this, but if you um, did fall into a situation where you had a district that uh, maybe was balancing their month end, but entered an adjustment in the future month, that threw off their balancing. Um, so that is now resolved. The next one here, I'm going to go down to this appropriations and receivables by cash account and run this report. I have a filter entered in here just because I kind of wanted to run it fast for our um, for the purpose of our training today, but generally this would run for all of your cash accounts. And when we look at this, um, so this report existed in here before. Um, what this update did though, let me zoom in a little bit for us, is we added this last column. And so this is cash plus receivable minus the carryover minus the appropriated. So um, basically we wrote a field that was able to do this calculation. Um, this is something that is similar to the classic report AppCom. So instead of rewriting an entire new report to replace that AppCom report, we created this field so that this existing report can be used for that. Let's see. Just want to make sure I hit everything on that. Okay. Um, There were a couple updates that um, had to do with customizing reports um, or creating custom reports. So um, we had um, an issue from a while back where some of the headers, if you added multiple control headers, then the label for the control header would show the word null. Uh, you used to be able to see this on the budget summary report, but we kind of had fixed that. Um, to show a different title in the meantime. Um, so really this just applies if you're creating a custom report and you're adding multiple control headers on there, um, it will now be able to determine what that, call or what that title should be. Basically, it's just basically the little label on the control header. Um, so not a big one there, but for anybody who writes custom reports, if that's something you run into, um, that will make your life a little bit easier there. Um, also, uh, with renaming customized reports. So I have all of these reports out here that um, you know, we've worked on, and if I go to the Edit button, um, this name had been grayed out um, for a bit, and we updated that to make sure that you can change the report name right from this grid again. All right, last stop with reports is um, I'm coming back up to my report menu and we're going to look at our canned reports here. So uh, the updates do apply to um, each one of these canned reports, but I'm just going to go into the account uh, status report just to take a look at one. Um, so the show report options checkbox has been added here and then also a format option. Um, the show report options, that works the same way as on your template reports. If you check that, then when you run the report, it will have that cover page, that options page. Um, and then the format uh, used to default to just PDF. You have a couple other options here now. Um, the formatted Excel, uh, view in a web page, um, the HTML ones, and plain text. Uh, right now, we um, we were unable to add the formats for Excel data, Excel field names, CSV, um, but that is something that we hope to add in the future. Um, these reports are a bit more complex, so it's just difficult to uh, translate them to that format. So this is kind of a step along the way is to um, at least add what we can for now. And the last thing with canned reports, um, we don't see it on this page, but in the report bundles, when you are adding reports there, you now have the ability to include canned reports on your report bundles. So that is the other update um, related to these reports. So that's about what I have for the report section. I'm going to start moving on to some of the updates with the other pages. Does anybody have any questions about any of those report updates?
Okay. Then the next place we're going, um, I'm going to come over to our transaction menu and let's look at the disbursement page. This one is a pretty simple update, but I really like it. <laughs> um, when we come in here, the um, update that uh, came out is to be able to change the void date. So I have this check, um, or this, yeah, this check, this disbursement right here that it's voided, and I can see on my grid it's voided as of uh, March 11th. And if I needed to change that date, I can click to view. And I have this option right up here at the top that says change void date. Now in order to use this, the posting period for the existing date and the posting period um, for the date that I want to change it to must be open. Um, when these checks are voided, you know, that does change whether they're included in outstanding figures. So if you are changing a void date from three posting periods back, um, that is why you would have to open the period because it would change an outstanding disbursement report, um, the figures on that. So just be aware of that if you're going to be using this option. Um, so to do this, I just do change void date. It opens up my field here. And I am actually in February, but I know that I have March open. So I'm just going to change this to February of 2020. Click Save, and then so now I'm good. So now this will no longer be outstanding as of my February report. Again, a pretty simple one there, but I've seen it before where, you know, maybe again at the end of the month, they're closing the month, but they voided with a new month date. So now their current month, um, or the month they're trying to balance rather, gets out of, um, gets out of sorts. So that one can definitely come in handy if you need it. Okay, the next thing I'm going to talk about is um, the report bundle for calendar year end. So uh, we added this originally in January. Uh, January 9th was the release that it was included on. Um, so we have this report bundle um, where we've set up the reports, um, kind of based this off of reports that would have been included in a fiscal year end bundle in Classic, um, since there really wasn't a calendar year end one, um, not a standard one anyway. And, um, you know, the intention is to set these so that they would run for the full calendar year and then they would send the reports to the December monthly archive and they would um, be included there with the December monthly reports. Now we have had some um, issues with this and one of the things that happened is that districts found it was only running for um, December because uh, we found that there was something within that mechanism that runs the report bundles that sort of limited it regardless of the dates that we had entered. Um, that was fixed on February 11th. So um, at this point, the bundle would run for the full year. Um, but um, once we did that, you can see on here this very first one is the audit trail. And if you've ever tried to run that report yourself, uh, it takes a long time. Um, that's one of the reports we plan to improve in the future. So all that to say, today we are um, working on a release. It should come out later today that will remove the audit trail from this bundle so that it can actually be regenerated. Um, so where this puts you guys, what to check is, um, for your district, so if this isn't something that you've run into so far, um, the first thing that I would say to check is their um, December 2019 folder in the file archive. All of the reports are labeled as calendar year end. So uh, take a look out there and um, you know, if they were able to get it to run for the full year, then they'd be all set. Uh, they do have options pages, so if you see that the dates are 12-1 to 12-31, then um, they may need to rerun that. Um, I would definitely wait until after this release uh, that comes out today. And 
Um, I'm not sure if we'll be putting the specific notes on how to rerun again in the release notes that come out today. But um, of course we're talking through this right now, but when you go to actually do it on 7.34.1, um, these release nodes do have the steps for how to regenerate that bundle. So if they already closed and they need to update it, um, then there are some steps out here for how you, they would do that or how you would go about helping them do that. And of course, once we get this audit trail out of there, um, we have this in there for next year. So, um, you know, we hope that that will go a bit smoother um, the next time around. I would show some of this with the file archive, but I'm in a test database, so my file archive is blank right now. Um, but if you are looking, it is under Utilities, File Archive, and then this is where you would be looking for your December 2019 uh, folder with the reports. This brings me to um, another thing I want to mention as well. Um, we found uh, an issue with the account change process. Uh, since that account change can actually change um, transactions that happened within the current fiscal year, there was a time period where if a district ran an account change, it was actually um, generating, it was because it has to go touch the previous posting periods for the year, it was um, running monthly bundles back to July for some districts. Um, so if you come out here for a district and you see that they have monthly bundles back to July of 2019, um, that is likely the cause of that. Um, we have seen instances where they may have a couple different versions of those reports as well if they ran multiple account changes. Um, I know that that is not ideal right now. It doesn't look super clean, but what we are going to do is um, add a way so that individual reports can be removed out of those folders. So for now, the recommendation is not to like delete and rerun. Um, I would just suggest leaving them there, and once they have a way to clean them up, they can remove extra versions um, unless they want to, you know, remove the entire folder um, for the beginning months. But I mean, at this point, I think you're best off just leaving them um, as they are. Okay, and the last big chunk I have for you here is transfers advances. Um, we've definitely been doing some work on the transfers advances. I wanted to um, show some of these updates and talk through them. Uh, so again, that was just I went to the transaction grid, and I'm coming down to the last one here for transfers advances. We're mostly going to talk about the repays on advances and how those have changed. Um, there is an update that does apply to both transfers and advances, um, and that is this last column here that shows the username. So I added this to my grid using the More option. Created user, I have a little section here where I can add this, and it will show me who created that. So you, you couldn't do that before, um, you know, but now maybe they want to see you know, who created this transfer if they have multiple people in their office that may enter those. Um, that can also be used on reports. That's now linked to this grid. So, um, you know, if that's something that uh, they're in, in need of, it's available now to have the username or the created user. Uh, let's see. Let's filter this. I'm just going to filter this down to my advances so we can focus on those. Oh, actually, you know what? I have this one advance is what we're going to use as a test, but maybe let's not filter it because I have these classic transfer advance in my test database. If you see these, these can operate the same as an advance. Why it's a classic transfer advance is because the accounts used were not were, were kind of mixed. So, um, you know, maybe one of the accounts was for a transfer, one was for an advance. Basically, there was some discrepancy out of the norm with the account code. So on import, uh, the system just kind of assigns it could be either. So 
Um, let's see. Okay, I'm getting there. I promise. I'm trying to make sure I get all of my notes before we kind of jump into all the um, to the part where we're going to look in detail at this. Uh, so a couple other side notes is first the time frame for repaying advances. Um, it used to be uh, that um, you had to you could only use the repay within the current fiscal year or the following fiscal year. Um, this was causing um, some issues with districts if they needed to re do repay in advance farther than that. So we checked with AOS because you know, that seems like something that would be dictated by them essentially. And they let us know that there are times when the advance can be repaid after that time frame. So you know, because that can happen, we wanted to allow that. Now, uh, there are, you know, potentially some um, expectations from AOS as far as like, you know, how, when those are expected to be repaid. Um, but at this point, that's essentially on the district. So, you know, as far as their timeframes, you know, they should work with their auditors, um, you know, to know those regulations, but the system is no longer going to limit that so that it, can allow it when it needs to when it needs to happen. The other thing we changed um, through discussion with AOS was the accounts that are used when processing um, the advances and the repays. There was um, some discussion on um, if it should be the return account or if it should um, use. Uh, if it should just basically reverse the accounts and, and sort of back out the advance. So at this point, it does use um, the standard accounts for the advance in and out. Those are documented on our wiki page. You can find those in the USAS manual. Um, and if you do need to like back out uh, an advance, then um, I believe you can use a reduction of expenditure. But th I don't know that that will happen very often. So um, just know, in the context of you know these updates, we have talked to AOS about the accounts that are used for those um, to ensure that that is consistent um, with what they are wanting uh, for those repays. All right, so so let's actually look at this advance now. Um, the first thing that you'll notice if you were in here before with the repays is we used to have this column that had the dollar sign. And so when you went to repay in advance, you could click that dollar sign, make the repay, and then it would um, pop up on your grid. Now we removed that dollar sign, but the reason we did that is because when that existed, the repay would throw into the same grid. But you couldn't, it wasn't really easy to tell like this repay belongs to this advance. So now if I click the I to view my advance, I get my pop up and um, what's been added is right at the bottom here we now have a repayments grid. So any repays that belong to this advance will show in this grid. Now they're grouped together, they can see that very easily. If they want to uh, repay this, um, they can click this plus icon. This would allow them to create an additional a repayment, they could enter the amount, enter the date, description, and then save this. And now I've got those repays, um, and I've got that second repayment in my grid here. Uh, I do have the um, accounts, so I can see those on the screen. I'm a little zoomed in here. Uh, for the training, so um, generally they'd be able to see those accounts. And then um, the other thing to note on this pop-up is this repaid checkbox. So this is unchecked. If I were to pay the remainder of this, and then actually I think I have to close out and go back in. Um, it does update that to show repaid. So I don't know like um, that you would necessarily use it on this screen so much because your plus sign is also 
blanked out so you could see that um, easier, but this can be added to your grid. So if you have a district that's really missing that dollar sign because they were used to just being able to see like I can still repay this one, um, you can you can add columns for uh, you know repaid onto the grid, then they can just filter it from there, or you'd have the true false you could see. So um, there are kind of new ways to be able to easily query um, and see which advances still need a repay. If I um, needed to cancel a repay, so say, you know what, I actually, I didn't mean to put this one in here. I can just go ahead, delete that out. I'm sure, yep. And now I do have the option to repay again. I'm no longer repaid. So that's pretty easy to add and remove those repaids there. Any questions about that? All right, well the last piece here then is to talk about linking um, the classic repays because, you know, classic didn't really keep the advances and the repays together. Um, so now that we have this little area within our advances in redesign, um, what we would want to do, you know, we want to see those on the classic transactions too. So in order to do that, it's sort of a one-time thing. Um, you can help your districts do this when uh, you import them into redesign when they're first going. Uh, for anybody that's live, this is something that can be um, done once and then they'll be linked. So let me pull up, I'm going to pull up a different tab here. And you know what? Let's go, let's go to the wiki. I know this was linked in uh, the release notes when this came out, um, but we did write a documentation page going through the process of how to link these. So I'm just coming into the USAS documentation and the appendix. And um, I think it's under useful procedures. So under useful procedures, link legacy repay transactions to advances. So this page kind of goes through the steps. Um, it has screenshots. It'll show you, we'll look at the report here in a minute, um, but it you know, has a screenshot of what this looks like um, and how to link these. So if this is something that you need to go through, um, you can come to this page. That'll help you through um, the process, but we're going to look at this process right now too. All right, so um, the first step on that was to look at the report. Uh, you don't have to do this if you kind of have an idea if you want to wing it, but this is very helpful for um, looking up the transactions. I'm so sorry for the scrolling. I forgot this was so far down here. Uh, I'm looking for the transfer advance activity report. And when I generate this, um, so normally I, well, the screenshot in there shows, you know, advance, you can filter this to advance and legacy repay. I do have some of those classic transfer advance, so I kind of already have that set in my parameters here because um, that's what we're going to look at today. Uh, if you leave this blank, it would run for everything. So, you know, if that gets a little bit complicated on what kind of transactions you have, you can certainly just run for everything and ignore the transfers. Um, so don't worry too much about that step, but let's generate this here. And what this is going to show me, so this shows me um, these, you know, classic transfers that I can see in my grid. Um, and let me get down to the second page because it's or actually the last page here because it's just broken up a little bit better. Um, so I have my classic transfer advance. So this is a transaction that I would be able to see in the grid. And then this is a repay. So I can't currently see this in the grid. So what I want to do is link this repay to this advance. Now, sometimes you'll have a couple per account. Um, I mean, generally, 
you know, the repays, I mean, they're definitely going to be back to the same cash account. Um, but if they have some complicated transactions where they may have had multiple repays, it may be something that you need to work with the district on. Um, just for the purpose of today, we're going to use this one since it's pretty straightforward. We can see it's for the same amount um, as the original advance. And you know what? Let me go. We updated this. We're, we're updating this report. So I this probably coming out in the release today. Um, let me, I'm just running the updated version. So this is what this report will look like soon. Okay, so actually you see this is the same thing. Got my account, got my figures. But what we did is we added the um, reference number to this first column. So the reference number is included on that um, transfer advance grid. So, so that's the difference. So that'll be updated soon. <laughs> Sorry, <laughs> grabbed the wrong one the first time around. Um, so what we're going to do is look and see this is, uh, this is reference number 100 and then, and we're updating this title to say reference number two. And uh, then the second one here is going to be our repay and that's reference number 102. So let's go use this information. My reference number for the advance was 100. Perfect. Here it is. I can see my amount. When I open this up, now I'm not going to use the plus because that's creating a brand new repay. What I'm going to use is this link icon. And I can see by the tooltip it says link the classic repayment to this advance. When I do this, I get my little pop-up and my drop-down gives me the reference number, the description, and the amount for all of these repayments. My, I know my repay was 102, so I'm going to go ahead and select that. Click Save. And now it shows in my grid. And um, so my transaction is repaid. And now my link icon, see that is um, not highlighted anymore. If I did have multiple repays that were like partials, it would work kind of the same way as the plus, where it wouldn't gray out until this is fully repaid. Amanda? Yes. It was the repayment on the grid before? The repayment before the updates, um, they used to be on the grid. Yes. I mean, I mean that 102 had that was like on the the grid before you linked it. Would it take it off? I, I don't know if it was on the grid. Oh. If it was on the grid, does it take it off the grid, or is it still there? Or um, so I think it depends on when we're talking about in our in how the system is right now. So when I go to link this and I'm grabbing this from here, the transactions I can see on here, I cannot currently see on the grid. A um, couple releases ago, so maybe, I don't know, like maybe it was like a couple months ago, you could see them on the grid, but they were taken off um, in a previous update. So um, at this current point in time, the system we're looking at now, no, it you won't be able to see these on the grid, and that's actually why we wrote the report, to make sure you had a way to look those up. Okay. So you're going to link them here, but you don't have to worry about like if it's going to show on the grid after it's linked because they're, they're basically already taken off and removed for that step. Okay. Once you link it, is it going to take mm -hmm. it off that drop-down list? Uh, it does. Yeah. Okay. It okay. does take okay. it off the drop-down list, and then if you unlink it, it puts it back. So here, let's – yeah, so now that I linked it, if I were to go into another one, pull it up, I can't use that same one on another advance. Okay, thank you. No problem. We did find a couple issues that we are currently working on with this. Um, with the drop down, just sometimes there are a lot of them for certain districts. So uh, when we did our testing, you know, we tried our best to go through, but you know, you can see in this t test database, I had just have a couple pages here. Um, but we did find if they have like pages and pages, um, some of the repays were not showing up. 
Um, we are working on that, so we hope to have that corrected in an upcoming release um, so that you know they can get everything linked. In the meantime, you know it's really not like too big of a deal if they can't link it immediately. So if they if you have districts that run into that situation, um, just leave it for now. They do still show up on the report, so if they needed to look up the repays, there are ways to do that. Um, but yeah, you may run into that if you're going and trying to link all of them. There, you know, if there's one that you can't find, just know that that will be resolved in the near future. Amanda, can you type in the uh, reference number for it to bring up if you know the reference number, or do you have to select? Um, the reference number, I yeah, you can't type in the reference number. So I think I've pretty much um, got to the pattern of scrolling. I think that's your best navigation route with these. Hey, um, the other, oh, sorry. No, that's right. Um, this is Michelle. Um, I know that was something that I asked about too in one of our um, sprint meetings. If we could just enter in the number. Um, so I think they are. They may be looking into that as an enhancement on down the road. But um, for, yeah, like right now, like what Amanda said, you're just going to have to scroll. There are little arrows here too that you can use. So if the scrolling gets gets a little odd, um, you know there that's um, a different different option, I guess. Um, the other thing to watch out for with these. So if you have a repay that happened in the current fiscal year, um, we did also get a report that that was um, adding an additional amount to the expended amount on the account. So basically the repay is already taken into account because those exist, and um, that was adding to the account. Um, that to basically kind of like double the amount for that repay on the corresponding expenditure account. Um, we haven't seen it very much because I don't know how many repays they've necessarily done in the current year, um, but some districts, you know, may do that more than others if they advanced before the end of their fiscal year. Um, so keep an eye out for that. If you have a district that uh, runs into that, you certainly do not have to link the repay. Uh, if you're seeing it, you can unlink the repay and it will correct the amounts. Um, Again, something that we're working on correcting um, and hope to have updated in the near future. So uh, yeah, if you have something in the current year that's causing you issues, I would say at this point, you can unlink it. Again, use that report to look up if you need to. Um, but I just want to mention that because if you are helping a district with uh, balancing issues, uh, that could be something that could cause a discrepancy on reports. So just keep an eye out there. All right, I just have some uh, a couple more miscellaneous things to go over, but really this this whole repay part is um, the big part of the update that I have for you today. So I just want to um, open it up one more time and see if there are any other questions about this part. All righty. Well, then let me close out of these. Um, again, just some really miscellaneous things here. I'm going to go to my purchase orders. Um, there were a couple updates uh, related to um, like amend. So the PO amend, um, you couldn't modify existing items, the existing item issued date, or I'm sorry, it was changed so that you cannot. So uh, let me think, I believe this one, I can come in here. So I'm just amending here and we can see the issued date right here. Um, I can't modify, there was, uh, that, that used to be open and that could cause problems, especially crossing fiscal years. Um, we've really been trying to work on that amend option to nail it down and make sure that um, that goes smoothly. The other thing is um, we, you, sorry, <laughs> we had a bug that was preventing a PO item from being canceled if the PO date was in a closed period. Uh, when we had our AP invoices, Fridays with Fiscal last month, we kind of talked about this and said, you know, um, at this point, you know, process the, the cancel full invoice. Um, but if you have a PO um, that's dated in a prior period and the item was not paid on, 
you can now cancel that line item on a PO without having to reopen the period. So say I copy this and then I wanted to cancel this line item, even though that's February, that would now be okay because it's going to stamp this with a canceled date in this period so that the um, so that your reports can still generate accurately in um, the current month. Next, uh, let's hop over to the AP Invoices page. And I'm going to open up one of these cancel invoices that I have here. You'll notice if you look at a cancel invoice, anything with cancel full or cancel partial, you don't have the option to click this action button before. Um, the action button wasn't intended to work with cancel items. Um, so just if that's a change that um, you know, you notice your district's notice, that is intentional. Uh, that basically is made to change it to like the actual full or partial status. So if you have canceled full and you click partial, it's like you don't want it to be partially paid. So we just went ahead and um, made sure that that was disabled for these so that it doesn't cause any issues um, or confusion. We also removed the AP um, Invoices legacy page. So uh, we've been working hard over the last six months to, you know, six, eight months to get everything in this AP Invoices page updated. Um, so we were finally ready to just get rid of that um, AP Invoice legacy page. So we don't have any more legacy pages in this transaction menu, which is kind of exciting. And um, my next miscellaneous thing is um, we did implement rules for distributions, invoices, and transfers and advances so that it looks at the account start and stop dates when determining if it can use an account. So this is something that has been on pl in place when you're entering requisitions and purchase orders. Basically that drop down of accounts that you get when you're going to attach the account um, that will only include accounts that can be used. So uh, just something to keep in mind, um, we, have an, um, we have a note on the FAQ page for this because it, it happens uh, every once in a while where they're looking for an account and it doesn't exist in the drop down when they're entering a transaction. Um, if that is the case, then your go-to would be to check that all levels of that account are active and that the start and stop dates include whatever transaction date that they are using. Last, I just have some notes about performance improvements. Um, we did improve the performance of saving the cash reconciliation. Uh, performance improvements were also made to the creation of budgeting of budget sheets. And then um, we made some budgeting improvements to kind of prepare for that part of the year. Um, so it's able to better handle the temporary and permanent budgets and then budget scenario promotion was also um, improved. So that's all I have for the USAS side. Um, do you guys have any other questions about anything that we went over, um, anything that you've seen in the recent updates? All right, well, thank you. I'm going to go ahead and pass it over to Andrea then, and um, she's got the USPS updates. Thank you, Amanda. No problem. Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Um, let me know if you cannot see the screen. Um, should be able to, everything should be on. Okay. <clears throat> let me bring up just a second. Okay. Um, if you have any questions, please, like Amanda said, um, just go ahead and unmute your um, 
option, and or you can actually um, also do a group chat. And I will try to um, take a look at those. <clears throat> okay. Um, what we're just going to be going over is a few of the releases <clears throat> from the last time that we uh, worked together on a, uh, Fridays with Fisco. Um, the first one we're going to be going over is the release notes uh, from the 6.3. Um, there was a bug fix on this one. It was for a, a payroll item refund ACH. It was not working. So when they were trying to do, like saying they were doing a refund for an employee um, and they wanted to, instead of giving them a check, they wanted to do the refund ACH. Um, that was not working. Um, even though we had that tab there, it still wasn't working. So they were able to fix that um, bug. And now, so when they do an error, re uh, error adjustment and they want to actually just send the employee um, directly to their um, bank account, mm -hmm. they can actually do that option now. Okay. Um, the next one is, what's it, 90? The report bundles um, for W-2 reporting. So now when they generate the W-2 submission report at calendar year end, that will be now included in the file archive. I don't have one that shows that because my files are um, just were um, copied over. So I don't have a calendar year end, but it will be a, like a 2020 calendar year end report. And then in the calendar and reports, I've got to find my documentation here. Where'd it go? There it is. Um, you will find the over here. And then now they will show actually in your reports under the calendar year and reports. So that would be including like your XML, your forms, your SSA, CCA, RITA, and city, and now the state for Pennsylvania. So that's where those reports will show um, at calendar end once they're ran. And we also in the documentation also have a payroll archive report bundles option um, where you can actually download this or copy and it can print it for you. And it shows what, what is in each of those report bundles and it breaks it down. And then we also added the calendar year W-2 reporting, and then the W-2 reports um, will show um, when they create the uh, SSA submission file. Then those reports will be um, copied out to your file um, under the file arch archive. Okay. Um, the next one. Um, the, they wanted to have, the users wanted a report sorting and subtotaling. And kind of the same what Amanda had shown, um, ours is kind of the, is about the same. Um, if you go under home, um, that's another option there where those are, were added under those reports. And now you will see the report options. You will see the query options and your sort options now. And those are listed for all the home reports for SSDT on, on this side. And then what you can do is you can just um, drag over if you want to add your sorting. Um, like right now for my birthday report, it's going to sort by building code and then by number and on down. But if you want to move some over and you want to sort by building and number, then you can move that over and generate the port report. And then also those options were actually added now under the report manager. So they'll show here now too when you're um, in your report manager. And they're also in the custom report creator. And then also they have now added those um, under the core, the only two options that they added these report options are under custom compensation and employee. So now when you go to the report here, you will see um, the re um, report options and the sort options. So when you're doing the report from the grid, um, those two are the options that they added those to. And they also added those to the report bundles. And the only thing here is, is the only bundles um, that are created by the user um, will show those new report options, not by the ones here in the SSDT. 
so. So that is that one. Um, the federal tax item, um, this is where they added the, the W-4 fields to the, for federal tax, and that's under payroll item, and then for the employee. So we'll just I'll select one here for all one here. And then now what they did is add a new, whole new section for new W-4 as 2020. And when that's not in use, these fields cannot be um, selected. So you cannot um, select those. So if they're still using the old W-4, um, then they will use the marital staff number up here. But when they do create a new W-4 for an employee, then they will want to go ahead and use the new W-4. And now these fields are um, edible. And, um, um, and then marital status and number of exemptions are ignored. And then um, if you highlight or like kind of hover over, um, you will see the checkbox and the W-4 and the W-2C has marked. So if they have questions, you can actually just hover over these spaces and it kind of explains what they are. And again, we have that in our, or in our documentation under payroll items. Um, if they have questions on how these fields work, if, or if, if you do, we can help you with that. Okay. Um, there was a, um, they added tokens to, for the new W-4, um, are now added to the check in the XML for direct deposits. So those are there now. And then those fields will only show um, if the, that checkbox on their O-01 is checked. So otherwise, if it isn't, then you will not see those fields um, on the check and direct deposit printing. So only if that box is checked will those show on those. Those new, the new tokens will show. Um, let's see, they also updated the federal tax, taxes for the year at that time. So, and I think that's it for the 6-3. Uh, moving on to the 641 release, um, only thing they did there was for the Medicare tax over the 2000 um, threshold, um, there was a bug that it was incorrectly um, calculating for the Medicare pickup employees, so they did fix that one back in January. And then they also, the federal tax IRS exemption, um, that amount moved up from 4300 and it moved, I mean, excuse me, went from 4300 down to 4200 um, On the 6-4 release, um, this is where they added the two date fields for uh, the adjustment enhancements. So if we go to the adjustments, and we'll take a little time here. We'll get there. See if I can go here. I got two up just in case. There it goes. Okay, so under adjustments, now when you go ahead and create an adjustment, um, you also are going to be able to see the two date options. This was something that um, districts were asking for. So then if you're selecting this option, it will include the, um, the adjustment journal and that month to date calculations. So those were added for pretty much all the payroll files for SIRS and STRS, W-2. Um, so that option is available um, for each one. Okay. And then the next one would go on to our 6.4. Um, in the custom report recreator, we had a request that they wanted 
the two date fields to be able to create or a report and show those. So now if you go to the custom report creator and go to payroll items, and now those options are listed here. So now they can actually pull those in and do a report. So those are all there now. And that was on the 642 release. The next one was the 6.5 release. Um, we did um, outstanding checks report. Um, what was happening that the issue date uh, was it was not pulling in correctly. Um, the issue date was not the pay date, and they wanted to when they ran the report they wanted it to be pulled by pay date and not the issue issue date to be the pay date, I guess. Um, but now it is running on the pay date when they're running the outstanding checks report. And they also did some updating to the headers, um, changed the first and last name. Um, now they have that all in one. They just have one tab for that and that's paid to name. So that was another update they did on that one. Okay. Um, the other thing they did was uh, an adjustment, the payroll description wasn't showing when they were in adjustments. Okay, I'll get that up there. I don't want to see that. There we go. So when they were in adjustments and they were trying to do an adjustment for an employee that might have several positions, um, payroll item by positions, they weren't able to see those because they didn't list the number um, position one, position two, position three, so they kind of had to guess which position was attached to the payroll item. So now they have that option when they do go in there and they do need to make an adjustment to a payroll item that has a position and number attached to it, now that will show in the payroll item um, drop down. So that was something that was updated also on the 6.5 release. Um, some other things that bug fixes that they did on that one, um, there was a bug in the payroll report that was excluding error adjustments from the summary totals. They fixed that. Um, there was a bug that the payroll item refund, refund service that was incorrectly withholding Medicare. So when they were trying to do a refund for an employee, then the, the Medicare was not being held correctly. Um, in the payment printing, um, it was excluding the payroll item error adjustments and the gross totals, so that has been corrected. Um, in the attendance import, it was combined like entries and it would fail due to a rounding issue, so they have corrected that. And also there was, when in the districts were running the employee master report, um, they had a column that was any of the non-current columns they were showing with a dollar sign next to them and they just wanted that fixed. So now that shows correctly and it doesn't have the dollar sign next to any of them that is non-current. Um, the ODJFS tax a wage base figure, um, that was changed from 9,500 to 9,000. So starting in for the first quarter of 2020, so now it's down to 9,000. Um, they also did some improvements this that time. Um, now when you probably notice when you're running payroll posting or payroll validation, it does go a little quicker um, and it doesn't take as long as what it did before. So hopefully you see some improvement in that. And I believe that is it for that one. Okay. So moving on to our 651 release, which was January 26. Um, they did have a bug fix on that one. It was the W2 um, the XML output. Um, when they were you, um, sending that and printing out the W2s, we had, we had an uh, ITC with a district that showed they had multiple city payroll items for the same city. So they had, when they were printing out the W2, it was printing like four or five, if they had five different positions attached to a city payroll or OSDI, they know that we figured it probably was for that one too. 
it was printing out multiple W-2s. Instead of printing all the city on one and all the city on um, OSCI on one W-2 and adding them all together instead of showing four different types. So that one was corrected. And I think that was just maybe one, one ITC that had that issue. Um, on the 6.6 release, um, we have a new feature, um, allow districts to submit their own ODGF submission files. So I don't know how many ITCs have actually started doing this for their districts and allowing this, but that is out there now. And the first thing that they would have to do is go to, I think it's actually, yep, go to oh, um, system and then configuration. And what they would first have to do is set this up, the, I, the district would have to. So once the ITC has decided that they want their districts to start doing that, then you guys can just um, have them go in, um, check the district will submit their own file to ODJFS, have them type in their transmitter title, which will probably be their district name, and a phone number. So once they do that and save that, now when they go to reports, ODJFS, right there you are. Now you would see this option under here would be um, listed. Before when they before that checkbox, this stuff down here would not show, and now um, that is checked, it will. So then when they run um, generate report, and then they can generate the submission file, and then they can actually send that to Eric um, on their own. They will not have to. ITC wouldn't have to do that for them anymore. So um, so this could probably be helpful for the ITCs. Um, if they want their districts to start doing that on their own. That option is out there now. Um, let's see, the next thing, well, we had an improvement where the posting period um, interface, um, they wanted it to be the same as how uh, the um, accounting UCSR was posting interface. So they, that is the posting period. So now, they have um, where in ours and the payroll, they were able to actually close a current month, so they would have it as false. So now we've changed that to where they have to have one current open at all time. Always has to be true. It cannot be uh, this whole, both of them cannot be false. You have to have one current, and then you can have several open if you're still working, but you always have to have one um, true for the current. And before that was where we would allow it to actually have it as false and have none current. So that was changed and updated. Um, the last pay date field, this was another improvement that uh, was done this time. There it is. Um, this was added also under the custom report recreator. So now when they go to employee and if they want to pull in employee's last pay date, that is now out there because that was a, a request. And you will see that kind of right down, almost right at the bottom if you scroll down just a tad bit, and it's right there, last pay date. So that has been added. Um, the next improvement, let's see, that was improvement saw they did. And then they did some bug fixes. Let's see, we had Medicare taxation or Medicare calculations over 200,000. They were having some issues with that calculation, so that was fixed at that time. Um, it was not including any of the adjustment journals that they were, so that was updated and fixed. So now with their employees over 200,000 and there was a journal, adjustment journal made, it will now include that in the calculation. All right, let's see, we have, um, we had another bug fix with employer distribution with doc pay. Um, if a district was docked a full pay of an employee, um, it was on the employer distribution report. It was still they still um, district still wanted the employer if the employee if the employee had employer um, um, payroll items being deducted, they still wanted those to be shown on the employer distribution report, even though the employee wasn't getting paid and there was no employee deductions or payroll items taken out, um, that is now fixed. And now so when they do have employee with a full doc pay, maybe no employee payroll items were taken out, but the board side was still taken out for the employee, 
those are now included in the employer distribution report and they were not before. So that has been fixed. Um, the next item is, let's see. Okay. Okay, I think I got everything for that one. Um, one thing they did, there was a bug in the SERS when they, uh, the report for uh, the adjustments were not looking at the pay group date range correctly. So when um, you were doing an adjustments or additions um, when running the SERS report, they what they decided that now if a district has that, that they just need to add um, on the SERS report, do a pay cycle for like 001 and a pay cycle for 002, um, entering the different dates, and then the adjustments should pull in um, with no problem now. So. Okay, so that was corrected then. And then, Okay, um, we'll move on to the next one is our 6-7 release notes. Um, we had some improvements in that one. Um, we had a, when an account code had all zeros for some reason for a, an employee, and then during payroll, it was pulling these employees in right into the very end, so the district did had no idea that there was even a problem. So then they had an issue when they were either after posting and then they had to go on post. So now um, this is fixed where they're running the payroll and it will catch it at, you know, immediately after they initialize the payroll. So now on their our error reports, they will get a cannot pay into account, all zeros, and then it will actually list for that employee um, number or their employee number. So then they can go ahead and fix that before they actually get um, through the whole payroll and it's posted. And that will be an error, so they won't e actually even be able to move on from from there until they get that fixed. Let's see, the next one is the SERS adjustments was not rounding to the scale of two, and that was a bug fix. So now um, the adjustments were allowing three decimal places um, when they were doing the on the adjustment for SERS but then the SERS uh, reports and the submissions were looking for a scale of two. So that was causing some issues. So they actually went in and um, changed that. So now both the adjustments and the reports are both only adjust adjusting um, to two. Um, the other fix that we did was we did a, this was just for maybe an importing from classic to redesign when they're coming on in. Um, there was an issue on the position date range. Um, what was happening, the start date from the position in classic was being imported into the higher date field in redesign. And I guess it should have been imported, um, import the calendar start and stop dates um, into the position start and stop dates. So that one is the 4284 um, JIRA, and that has been corrected. Okay. So moving on to our 68, um, they did add the new tax estimator, um, which was tax tab in um, Classic. So that has been updated and added. So, so now we have it under utilities, and actually in order to see that, Maybe that is under modules. Yes, right here. So first, for in order for the district to see that, they would have to go under systems and to modules, and then they have to make sure that they have this uh, module installed first. Then once they do that, then they can go to utilities, and it will show away at the bottom here. So now, just like it did in Classic for the tax tab, now they can go ahead and calculate an employee's tax information, um, they can find the employee, they can, once they find the employee, then move there and do the filled data. And what it does then, it actually looks at 
the W-2 um, information from the 001. So whatever is on the 001 record will actually fill in down here. So this employee actually has the new use 2020 information. So if I just put in a gross pay and calculate, and then it gives me the current estimation for both, for all three. Now, if you want to just kind of change and see what's going on, um, if they want to change different things, then they can actually change uh, maybe their gross pay and calculate again. And what it does, it keeps what you had previously over and then what is the current calculation. So you can kind of compare now what they have. Um, if they actually have um, maybe some income added and you want to see what that's calculated, Okay, with income added, this is their current estimation for federal, and then what it was without. So hopefully that will be pretty handy um, to the districts now um, for that. So actually they can just go ahead and pull in anybody. So if they need to find a new employee, they just go ahead and find that new employee and make sure they do find employee. And then that brings in that employee and move them over to the right using the selected and then to fill data. So this employee actually doesn't have the new box or the use 2020 W4 box filled, um, checked in the, their 001 record. So it's going to use the information here. So you can see it did not include any of that other information. But if they did want to see what it would be if they did use the new one, then they would just have to click that box. Then that option comes up below and then they can go ahead and do their calculations. They also have the option for the two like jobs. So if that was checked on the old one, that would actually come over too. Or if they want to actually do that when they're um, just want to see what their taxing amounts would be, then they can go ahead and um, check that. So that is, um, I think, going to be very handy for districts, and I think they'll be very pleased with that. Andrea? Yes. Um, do you do we recommend that they, on the jobs or the compensation, do, if they have multiple ones, do we just have them pick one or should they be picking all of them? I'm not clear on what's the best thing to I do. I believe that it calculates, I mean, they can, they can, they can bring over if they have two jobs um, into the selected to figure out what the calculation is. Now, the only thing is that maybe if they have a supplemental and they have it being taxed differently, I don't believe it will work for that. Just like in Classic, you would have to, you know, those shots would have to be taxed in the same. Okay. Could you pull that one separately, do that one individually? Yeah. Right. Okay. Correct. You could do that, yes. It's just that if you're trying to do one that's being taxed regularly and then you're trying to bring a supplemental that's maybe annuities uh, against, you know, regular, um, then that won't work. So it kind of follows still the classic way that it worked. Just we have a added a lot more fields. But yes, you should be able to pull just that job in um, over to the selected, and it should calculate because it's looking that it knows that that job is being taxed differently plus with the, it's just that it can't do it together. Okay, thank you. Okay, that was a good question. Thank you. Okay, any other questions on the tax uh, estimator? I still want to call it tax tab. Okay. Um, let's see. And another thing that was changed in there, oh, a big one. Um, payroll item ordering change, because we had a lot that it was um, how the system is taking, like, their items when they're getting paid, the order. That has been changed. So now... Uh, Get out of there. I know what? Oh, geez, sorry. I'm clicking on things and things are disappearing. Okay, let's try this again. So now, when in the documentation, if you go to the payroll items, we actually have that listed under there now. And here in the top, um, if you want it, it will take you directly down under miscellaneous notes, the order in which payroll items are processed. So now it's following like how Classic did. Before it wasn't, it was maybe taking, um, if they couldn't get all the money out for a payroll item, it was taking what it could and then putting the rest in for the next pay. 
Um, so now that when the payroll items are order, um, withheld, um, it, it's all or nothing. So if I can't rehold, withhold something for a payroll item, it's going to put it as an um, error adjustment for the next time. And then also the payroll item uh, processing order, this is how, how it's going to be ordered and this is what it's going to uh, try to take out first and then on down. And we also made this printable if uh, districts want to keep that right um, on their desk so they can see that. Um, also, um, another thing they did was the search and search withholding. Um, if an employee's, employee's withholding total um, types to zero and the results in a missed deduction, um, so that means the, then the entire employer share will also be missed in the error adjustment created for the employer amount. So those are two are different. So you remember that it's not, if the employees, if it can't withhold the employee amount, it's not going to withhold the employer portion of that payroll item either. So, um, so just to let your districts know that that one um, is, is different. It's not going to still withhold it even if they um, couldn't withhold the surcharge for the employee. So that one they thought would be easier, just withhold nothing on both sides. So, okay, any questions on um, how we updated the payroll items? Okay, um, our next is the text tab. Okay. Um, there was an error. Uh, they were getting added an error when a position is included in the payroll without pay accounts. So now when they're um, in payroll and they're running, and there's actually a, um, I know we were running into this quite a lot, where they were getting um, an error, um, it was showing that they were all green on the initialization, but they were getting a red that it failed. Um, and what it was was because there was no payroll accounts added for an employee, and it wasn't um, getting giving them an error on the error report. So now um, for this uh, fix, now when they run the error report and there is none, it will catch it and put it on the error report and say no payroll accounts, not enough accounts to distribute charges for followed employee number and position. So actually it will list the employee's number and position. And then they also added another error on there. It says future pay for pay type, um, the gross amount not added. So, and then it will say no payroll accounts, not enough accounts to distribute charges for the employee number, position number for the future pay employee. So actually um, they will get um, a two error message. So I think that's going to save um, districts a lot of time and headache um, when they were getting, it looks like it was um, going to run, but then they get the red fail, and that was why. So now they should not, and it should be able to be put right on the airport, and they'd be able to catch that, fix that, um, modify that pay group, and um, recalculate. And then that error, that red fail should um, no longer happen. Okay. Um, the next one they did was a non-contract compensation. Um, when they were trying to pay employees, um, they were currently removed. Um, for some reason, the position pay was um, currently removing the daily non-compensation from the payroll when they were initializing. Um, so now they corrected that. So now um, the system will check if they're both hourly and daily for non-contract compensation when they're running that. So that has been fixed. Um, the next thing is the compensation um, amounts, um, which includes, so now um, they can see the compensation amounts when they're under the compensation, and they will be able to see the amount earned, amount docked, amount paid, pays paid, um, through the app. So now when they go into the more button, which I think I already added, but if you go into the more button and way at the bottom, that's where these are listed now, compensation amounts. So they can add those to the grids now, and now they can see those if they want to run a report from the grid, they can do that. And now they'll show here. And I think they're going to be very happy about that because I know they've been wanting to wanting that in there. So. Okay, 
And also those should be also when they're in the cu create, um, custom recreate for compensations, um, it will also show there. So, okay. Um, let's see. The next thing was avoided check being reported on the STRS monthly in the fiscal year date report. So what was happening was if an uh, employee had a void payment um, and they, it, it wouldn't show on the STRS report, but it was showing when they were running the STRS monthly report. And so they were trying to compare these reports and they were seeing that difference. Well, the difference was if an employee had a, a void, it was still trying to include that on the STRS monthly report. So that has been updated and now um, the voids will not show on the STRS report and um, it will match um, exactly what uh, the payroll report is, the STRS payroll report, or the report is. Um, another thing that they um, updated was if an employee was missing a federal record, um, they wanted an error to be produced. So what they did was actually, um, if, if they didn't have any, um, they would have an error report after initialization of their pay, they would have a, no active federal tax payroll exists for the employee number, so, and then it would be filed by the number and the employee. So it will actually let them know who the employee is and their, um, their position number. So um, now that has been updated and they would have to go ahead and make sure they have that set up correctly and or add the federal tax for that employee. And then they can go ahead and update and reinitialize, reinitialize and that should be corrected. Okay, so I think that is all we had for 6-8. All right. Okay, I think that's all I have for our. And there was a fix on the 681, um, and that was due to the release that was from the 4471 release, um, and that was on the 68, um, where they had, if they didn't have that federal record for error, um, there was a bug that was introduced then at that time and they fixed that then on the 6-8 back on March 2nd um, because uh, a district cannot um, go ahead with their payroll because everything was erroring out. And what it was was due to um, that federal error record. So, so actually that federal record that they introduced, um, then they had to go ahead and actually um, removed it because the error was issuing, it was causing too many problems. So that kind of, it kind of went back and forth that um, I still believe they're going to work on that and then once they can get that fully fixed with no errors, then that would be reintroduced. So, okay. I think that's all I have on my um, releases for um, the last month or so or back, back in December. Is there any questions on any of those? Okay, then I think we'll go ahead and we'll, we'll end the session. Um, I thank you again for joining us today. And I hope you join us again for our next Fridays with Fiscal. Yeah, I was just going to say, Andrea, we do have our beginner trainings for USAS are going to be next week, uh, Tuesday, Wednesday, ah. Thursday. So okay. um, those are definitely still on and um, will also be recorded and posted um, out on the training page once they're complete. All right. Thank you, Amanda. Yeah, no problem. Thanks, everyone. Thank you. You have a nice weekend. <laughs>